Today I want to discuss something that I think about often. Am I dead? But I continue to have this question, am I dead? Nobody really gives me the most salient answer to that question. But she is a hospice nurse. And for 45 years, she has been one. In those 45 years, she helped thousands of people transitioning. But people don't quite understand that when one departs this world, that the world does not terminate at the point where my senses cease to register it, that he continues restored, unbelievably new. Each person approaches death in their own way, bringing to this last experience their own uniqueness. What is listed here is simply a guideline, a roadmap. Like any map, there are many roads arriving at the same destination, many ways to enter the same city. And that to us, well, he dies. Well, if he dies to us, therefore he'll die again. That dying again is simply going from one stage to another stage to another stage. It says, because if I drop now at this very moment, you would say Neville died, but I don't die. I simply pass through a door it's so thin, the little garment, the little thing that separates this world from that world, which is not anything more than an extension of this world, is so thin. It is so thin that separates this world from that world, and they don't die at all. There is a shift that occurs within a person that takes them from a mental processing of death to a true comprehension and belief in their own mortality. Unfortunately, this understanding is not always shared with others. This is the dying experience. You die to those who see you go, but you never really die to yourself. You don't die to yourself. You only die to those who can't follow you, but nothing in this world ever dies to itself. It is unaccountably restored and it's new. You die here when you lose almost all your faculty. If you die tonight, your belief will not be transformed, but you will be restored to life in a world just as real as this one. Death comes in its own time, in its own way. Death is as unique as the individual who is experiencing it. And they don't die at all. But the miracle is, how do they, dying here old and withered and minus senses, eyes are gone, teeth are gone, hair are gone, and when they are restored, unaccountably new, best suited for the work yet to be done in them. But you never really die to yourself. You don't die to yourself. You only die to those who can't follow you. But nothing in this world ever dies to itself. It is unaccountably restored and it's new. You die here when you lose almost all your faculty. If you All of us will face this in one manner or the other. These are the general signs you begin to see. The withdrawal from the world and people no longer has any real importance. You're not hungry. <clears throat> Food just, you know, doesn't mean anything anymore. Sleepy all the time. All the time. Going inside of self. If you die tonight, your belief will not be transformed, but you will be restored to life in a world just as real as this one. You will know the same limitations as you know here. You will suffer, be deceived, betray, and be betrayed until you believe to the point of action and you will depart this age of death to enter the age of life by controlling your own wonderful human imagination. And the real thing is, is that we're with others. But this journey is one that is going to require just you. She says, as the acknowledged that yes, I am dying, becomes real, a person begins to withdraw from the world around them. This is the beginning of separation. First from the world, no more interest in newspapers or television, then from people. No more neighbors visiting, tell Aunt Jessie I don't feel like company today, and finally from the children, grandchildren, and perhaps even those persons most loved. This is the beginning of um, becoming a time of withdrawing from everything outside of oneself and going inside. That we continue this eternal recurrence 
until we awaken the imagination. And when we do, we start to sort of change the world around us and that awakens the God within us. And then we move on to the next world, which is perhaps another simulation, much more advanced, much more complicated. A time of withdrawing from everything outside of oneself and going inside. Inside where there is a sorting out, evaluating oneself, in one's life. But inside, there is only room for one. This processing of one's life is usually done with the eyes closed, so sleep increases. But it's a question that continually comes to me, am I dead? It's very possible that I am, and I have to come to grips with, I'm in this reality and I have to accept it. But know that important work is going on inside on a level of which outsiders aren't aware or allowed in. With this withdrawal comes less of a need to communicate with others. Words are seen as being connected to the physical life that is being left behind. Words lose their importance. Touch and worldness take on more meaning. The afterlife is culturally relative insofar as its imagery is projected by the perceiver and the perceiver has been conditioned by the culture in which he was educated. The essence of mind is the same for all sentient beings. We eat to live. When a body is preparing to die, it is perfectly natural that eating should stop a different kind of energy, get this, is now needed. This is a spiritual energy, not a physical one, and it will sustain from here on. She says there's a different kind of energy which is needed now. This, this energy is a spiritual energy and not a physical one. And the spiritual energy will begin to take over from the physical one and will begin to sustain everything from here on. There is literally one foot in each world. They may see and converse with loved ones who have died before them. Focus is changing from this world to the next one. They are losing their grounding to earth. Any meditation that allows you to become familiar with your mind will prepare you for death. We're forced to relate to our mind simply because there's nothing else. Outer world is gone, body is gone, so mind becomes reality. Through insight, meditation will discover that whatever arises is just the display of our mind. That recognition sets us free. In many ways, the spiritual path is just death in slow motion. We can summarize it thus. If you die before you die, then when you die, you will not die. If you spiritually die or transcend your false sense of self before you're forced to do so at death, then when you physically die at the end of this life, you will not die because you are already dead. You have already died to your limited sense of self. Each stage is accompanied with signs that can help the dying person and those around them. The signs help us recognize where we are and where we're going. When someone stops eating, for example, that can be a sign that the fire element is dissolving and death is imminent. The fire element is involved in digestion, the burning up of food. If a seriously ill loved one stops eating, it's time to go see them if we want to be there before they die. The bardo is painful because it hurts to let go. We're forced to let go of everything we have and everything we think we are. One of the reasons it's difficult to leave this world is because we are so familiar with it. It's all we know. Even though it's samsara, we feel snug and secure in its ways, and these ways are hard to abandon. Conversely, one of the reasons it's difficult to enter the next world is because it's so unfamiliar. We don't know it at all. Even though it presents great opportunities for enlightenment, we're afraid to step into the unknown. So too much familiarity with this world and not enough with the next is what makes this transition difficult. The spiritual energy for transition from this world to the next has arrived and it is used for a time of physical expression before moving on. The surge of energy is not always as noticeable as the above examples, but in hindsight, it can usually be recognized. The one to two week signs that were present earlier become more intense as death approaches. Generally, a person becomes non-responsive, unable to respond to their environment. Most times, this is noticed right prior to death arriving because it hurts to let go we're forced to let go of everything we have and everything we think we are 
One of the reasons it's difficult to leave this world is because we are so familiar with it. It's all we know. Even though it's samsara, we feel snug and secure in its ways, and these ways are hard to abandon. Conversely, one of the reasons it's difficult to enter the next world is because it's so unfamiliar. We don't know it at all. Even though it presents great opportunities for enlightenment, we're afraid to step into the unknown. So too much familiarity with this world and not enough with the next is what makes this transition difficult. Releasing our grip is what transforms this painful bardo of dying into the simple bardo of dying. For someone who has completely let go during life, nothing happens at death because there's nothing left to release. The nature of mind is laid bare. What is revealed is the same for everyone, but it is not experienced the same way. The nature of mind or formless awareness is raw and naked mind itself before any conceptual or cultural clothing is placed upon it. Although all of us will see this intrinsic awareness during death, the nature of our mind, the experience of it is so brief that most of us will not even notice it, let alone maintain it. Thought becomes reality just like in a dream. But unlike a dream, we can't wake up and take refuge in a solid body. Since this bardo is ruled by the winds of karma, the experiences are particularly fickle. These winds are not literal winds, of course, but a metaphor for how we are blown around by the power of karma. Unable to respond to their environment, most times this is noticed right prior to death arriving. Um, cannot be awakened. Body no longer responds and departure has taken place. She says how we approach death is going to depend upon our fear of life. How much we participated in that life and how willing are we to let go of this known expression to venture into a new one. Fear and unfinished business are two big factors in determining how much resistance we put into meeting death. As the separation becomes complete, when breathing stops, what appears to be the last breath is often followed by one or two long spaced breaths and then the physical body is empty. The owner is no longer in need of a heavy, non-functioning vehicle. They have entered into a new city, a new life. She has this poem right here. I'm standing upon the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength. I stand and watch her until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud, just where the sea and sky come to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side says, there, she's gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight. That is all. She is just as large in the mast and hull as far as she was when she left my side, and she is just as able to bear the load of life freight, living freight, to her destined port. Her diminished size is in me, not in her, and just at the moment when someone at my side says, there, she is gone. There are other eyes watching her coming and other voices ready to take up the glad shout. Here she comes, and that is dying.